Amazon cracks down on 50,000 Chinese sellers. Most of them are suspended for posting fake reviews or sending out gift cards in exchange for positive reviews. All three of America's most powerful nuclear submarines were reportedly sent into the Pacific Ocean. A rare move as the three are all patrolling the same area at the same time. The U.S. Strategic Command is sounding the alarm, saying the strategic breakout of China's military is a cause for action. Chinese state media declares China the winner of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. That's despite the U.S. taking home the most medals. And some elementary and middle school students in China must get vaccinated, or they can't attend school. That's according to local authorities, even though Beijing claims the shot isn't mandatory. Hello and welcome to China in Focus. I'm Evelyn Lee, in for Tiffany today. U.S. retail giant Amazon is suspending 50,000 Chinese sellers. That's for reportedly large numbers of fake reviews on its products. Electronics retailer Aki and wholesaler TomTop are among them. The widespread suspension has dealt a major blow to China's industry, especially the southern province of Guangdong. According to Chinese media, almost half of these Amazon sellers are based there. An industry insider explained this is the fifth time Amazon has suspended sellers from China. And as for revenue, these companies' total losses are expected to hit more than $15 billion. According to Chinese media outlet Caixin, the suspensions mostly target companies who knowingly violate Amazon's policies. That's including some sellers who hire fake clients and post fake reviews. Some have also been known to insert gift cards into their products, with notes asking for positive reviews. In a rare move, the U.S. reportedly sent all three of its most powerful nuclear submarines into the Pacific Ocean, a possible show of naval strength to adversaries like China. In a tweet, the United Service Organizations unofficially confirmed that the USS Seawolf, Jimmy Carter and Connecticut had set sail from Washington. The United Service Organizations is a corporation that supports members of the U.S. Armed Forces. The submarines are all of the same class and each of them carries 50 torpedoes. These vessels are the biggest, most heavily armed and fastest in the U.S.'s naval fleet. A Forbes report explains that normally vessels of the same class take turns deploying. And it's rare for these submarines to be deployed together because it takes a lot of resources. The report says if the U.S. was at war with China, it would need to deploy all three vessels. So the U.S. showing its capability like this is a significant move. The U.S. Strategic Command is sounding the alarm on China's rapidly growing military capability. We are witnessing a strategic breakout by China. Their explosive growth and modernization of its nuclear and conventional forces can only be what I describe as breathtaking. Make no mistake, China's strategic breakout is a cause for action. Richard made the remark during a speech at the Space and Missile Defense Symposium last week. He warned against judging Beijing's nuclear capability simply based on the difference in stockpile size between China and the U.S. What matters is they are building the capability to execute any plausible nuclear employment strategy. Then in 2019, the uh, PRC test launched more ballistic missiles than the rest of the world combined. Richard says Beijing's military buildup also includes construction of over 200 new intercontinental ballistic missile silos. He points out that if you add all this up, what you get is something inconsistent with a minimum deterrence posture. U.S. Strategic Command is a branch under the Department of Defense that oversees strategic deterrence, global strike and the country's nuclear arsenal. As U.S. concerns over China's military rise, Russia is instead commending Beijing. The Russian defense minister recently praised military cooperation between Moscow and Beijing and suggested it could develop further. That's after he flew to China for joint military drills involving more than 10,000 troops. The joint drills ended Friday. Other nations kept a close eye on the event, looking for signs that the Chinese communist regime and Russia are expanding military ties and allegiance against the West. Russia and China have conducted joint drills since 2005, but the Russian defense minister noted that this was the first time the Russian military has taken part in an event of this kind in China. With a high level of interaction between armed forces on land, in the air and at sea, 
A Russian newspaper said the drills also marked the first time Russian soldiers used Chinese weapons. China remains Russia's biggest trade partner, and the first railway bridge between the countries is set to open soon. Chinese state media is declaring China the winner of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games, according to pictures posted online. That's despite the U.S. taking home the most medals. The CCP mouthpiece is assuming the title by claiming medals belonging to Taiwan and self-governed regions such as Hong Kong. Entity's Joanna Conway brings us the details. Images on Chinese state-run media appear to declare China as a winner of the recent Olympic Games. That's despite the International Olympic Committee officially declaring Team USA as champions. The United States finished with 39 gold medals, 41 silver and 33 bronze, a grand total of 113 medals. China ended up with 38 golds, 32 silver and 18 bronze, totaling 88 medals. But China's CCTV showed a different medal count, with China claiming medals won by Hong Kong and Taiwan. Images shared on Chinese social media site Weibo show China also claiming Macau's gold, taking their total to 42. On this basis, Chinese state-run media is claiming an Olympic win for China. The International Olympic Committee, however, recognises Taiwan and Hong Kong as independent competitors. Joanna Conway, NTD News. Activists fear new development spells trouble for Hong Kong's freedom. One of the city's biggest pro-democracy groups announced plans to dissolve on Sunday. Its former leaders are now in prison, charged under Beijing's national security law. And it is Trevor Piper with more on that. A pro-democracy group that organized some of the biggest protests during political upheaval in Hong Kong is dissolving. The Hong Kong Civil Human Rights Front says it can no longer operate. According to local media, the group is facing a police investigation into possible violation of a national security law. Former leaders of the group are currently in jail on charges related to their activism. The Civil Human Rights Front is the organizer of the annual protest march marking the territory's handover to China in 1997. The group is the largest to disband amid a sweeping crackdown on dissent in the region. Earlier last week, Hong Kong's largest teachers' union also disbanded. The crackdown follows Beijing's imposition of the national security law last year. The legislation outlaws secession, subversion, terrorism and foreign collusion. It was used to arrest more than 100 pro-democracy figures and close pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily. The crackdown has virtually silenced opposition voices in the city and drawn US sanctions against Hong Kong and Chinese government officials. Trevor Piper, NTD News. No vaccine, no school. That's the latest mandate for many students in China and even their families. While this is not a policy enforced from the top, an official says they have been tasked with increasing vaccinations in schools. Beijing has said getting the CCP virus or COVID-19 vaccine is voluntary. But several areas in China have recently issued notices ordering students and their families to get the shot. Ms. Chen is from central China's Wugang city. She told NTD about what's going on in her area. Now it's mandatory for primary and middle school students to take vaccines. If not, the kids won't be able to go to school. It's still summer vacation in China. Local authorities are now urging students to get vaccinated before the fall term begins. In northern China, officials in Hebei province are ordering students aged 12 to 17 to get two shots during summer vacation. If they don't, they won't be able to attend school. Reports of the same policy are also coming out of eastern China in Huangshan City. And on top of that, a document from southern China's Guangxi province says if any family members haven't been fully vaccinated, that family's children will be suspended from school. Similar requirements are active in southeast China's Jiangxi province. Ms. Chun explains how layers of officials push the vaccination. They have some documents. Then the mayor will confirm the orders. The teachers will then post the notice. If you haven't taken the shot, the teacher will call the parents. Their kids will be rejected by the school, along with other policies. On the surface, they say it's voluntary. But in fact, what they say from top is one thing. What they do on the lower levels is another. So why does this happen? NTD reached out to Wugang City's local pandemic control office to find out.
Let me tell you the truth. It's the pressure from upper authorities, you see, from Beijing to the province level, from the province level to our city level. That's the case. It's a political mission, even though it claims it's voluntary for people, but it's already set as an assessment criterion to test the local government's ability to mobilize. Ms. Chun explained local authorities force residents to sign an agreement saying should anything happen, they're not responsible for the risks. A woman in China collapsed after taking the country's homegrown virus vaccine. And then just weeks later, she died. Chinese authorities say it's not because of the vaccination. An elderly woman who collapsed after taking a Chinese-made dose of the CCP virus vaccine has passed away just three weeks after getting vaccinated. Her relatives question whether the vaccine was directly tied to her death, but authorities work to keep the details quiet. It happened in southwestern China's Chongqing city. She now has heart failure. Her heart rate and blood pressure are half of what's normal, and she can't maintain it anymore. She's like that due to the vaccination. I explained clearly to the doctor that night. Last week, the sister of the deceased woman shared the details with the Epoch Times. She said her sister told her that after getting the shot, she lost sensation from her head to her feet and that her facial muscles were weakened. She slept during much of her hospitalization. She told us when she was awake, seeing she collapsed when trying to stand up after the shot. I heard another case where a man was outside the ICU talking to the doctor, saying, I'm not saying the vaccine is bad, but my father collapsed after the shot. I was sent to the hospital. Tsai said that officials refused to attribute these cases to the vaccine. There are many cases like that in the hospital. Some died. A person in their 30s got the vaccine shot in the hospital and died shortly afterwards. Maybe the authorities stepped in and got it settled. Many other areas in China have reported similar incidents. In late July, a father disclosed online that his son got a fever and was sickened after getting a Chinese-made vaccine and died a week later. Chinese medical experts have called the cases coincidental reactions. They claim the victims had been infected by the virus before taking the shot, but were asymptomatic, and that vaccine shots triggered their symptoms. Part of China are still struggling to get the Chinese Communist Party virus, known as COVID-19, under control. In central China's Zhengzhou city, authorities announced over the weekend that all elementary and middle schools will delay reopening for another week. Online lessons are set to begin at the beginning of September. At the same time, all restaurants in the city are closed, public parks are restricting who can enter, and residential neighborhoods mandate temperature checks for those coming and going. One parent named Mr. Hua told the Epoch Times that his child's school also has a new rule in place, saying all parents must provide daily information about the infection risk of the area where the child lives. Areas in the city are divided into high, medium and low risk zones, reflecting how likely virus infection is there. That measurement mainly comes from the number of confirmed virus cases found in each area. Though, as the virus continues to spread, more low-risk areas are getting upgraded to high-risk warnings. Zhengzhou City kicked off its fourth round of mass virus testing over the weekend. In comments to the Epoch Times, Mr. Hua also explained he witnessed something unusual during the rounds of public testing. He described that in the first three rounds of virus testing, locals came en masse creating waiting lines at check-in stations that moved slowly. But by the fourth round, very few people showed up. The whole process only took half a day, and the lines were short throughout. That's compared to the third round of testing, which took two full days to complete. Mr. Hua says he suspects either fewer people want to get tested now, or that the public wasn't fully informed by authorities. People in China are still dealing with the effects of the floods, but it's not easy for journalists to get their stories out. The Epoch Times spoke to a local who lived through it. Let's hear their perspective. And today's Don Ma has more. Severe flooding in parts of Hebei province last week following heavy rain. Official reports say more than 8,000 people are affected and over 20 people killed. But a survivor's eyewitness account suggests the death toll could be higher. In parts of Srejo City, flood water levels rose above 8 feet. A local flood victim tells the Epoch Times her account of the disaster's severity. The first floor of buildings have been completely submerged. 
people have escaped to the second floors. Some homes don't have a second floor. Flat waters block the door shut. You can't open it. They just drowned in their home. What can you do? So many people drowned. There are even families of four or five that all drowned. It's terrible. Miss Zhou says the flood came during the night on Thursday when most people were fast asleep. What's more, flood waters rose suddenly. It was so dangerous at the time. People had nowhere to escape. Around 2 or 3 a.m., my neighbor went out to try to save his car, but he ended up getting washed away by the flood. Even now, he's yet to be found. His family is searching everywhere. They have no idea where he is. The first floor of Miss Joe's home is also flooded, but luckily her home has a second floor. Flood waters are starting to recede from the roads, but they still can go to the store. The water is still covering the roads. Cars can get across. Water level in the river are not going down. There is so much damage and loss. Reports came last week saying that dozens of reservoirs in Suizhou City are overflowing, and at least one of them had discharged water. Ms. Zhou says some official rescue workers came, but turned back when they couldn't get past the flooded roads. It's a common practice for authorities in China to discharge water from reservoirs when they're at risk of overflowing amid heavy rain. Authorities often release the water at night and without warning, so they don't have to pay compensation to residents affected. Don Ma, NTD News. 70,000 flood victims have nowhere to go after authorities drove them out of their temporary housing with concerns about the virus. The authorities had moved them there so they could flood the residents' homes, siphoning off water from a reservoir. Over 70,000 people in China's Henan province are being displaced again. They were first directed to leave their homes in compliance with authorities' flood policy, but now they're being kicked out of their new shelters for fear of the pandemic spreading. Late last month, flood risks started ramping up. Located inside a major flood zone, the county of Wangzhuang evacuated its residents. Once cleared, authorities exploded open a nearby dam and let the flooding in. The decision was made in order to protect another wealthier area from extreme flood damage. One Wangzhuang resident was arranged to stay in a disaster shelter at a local college. To protect her identity, we give her a pseudonym, Guo Li. Guo told the Epoch Times she lived at the shelter for nine days, but was then dismissed amid fears the virus would circulate there. Official numbers report nearly 150 confirmed CCP virus or COVID-19 cases in the province. Authorities are concerned that once cases emerge inside the shelter sites, further spread will be hard to control. They dismissed everyone. Buses took us to the crossroads of a local county hall, but we didn't get a chance to see the officials and nobody helped with our settlement. We cannot return home and have to find a place to live. Some rent, some have no water or electricity. Guo says she now rents a room in a small town and is completely on her own. They promised a subsidy of $25 per person per day to those dismissed from the settlement sites. But up till now, after a whole day, we haven't seen that money. Guo told us the flooding from the dam went on much longer than expected. Many are now trying to drain the floodwaters from their basements. And on the streets, people are seen wading through puddles of dirty water. There is no water or electricity. Large pools of water sit right at the doorway. It's all that kind of greenish water and smells terrible. You can't see during the day, but with a flashlight at night, you can see the water is filled with bacteria and bugs. Guo said authorities refused to take responsibility. We, the people, took our part of the responsibility when the floods came. Authorities asked us to evacuate, and we did. We would go anywhere they wanted us to. We listened to the party and followed their instructions. But where is the party now? She told us only two local shops remain open. None of the others have recovered yet. She notes that locals saw trucks arriving filled with supplies, but adds that none of it went to residents in need. China's economic leap seen in recent months has lost its momentum. Factories are facing major disruptions and a retail dip in July. And today's Patrick Hayden has the details. China's manufacturing and retail sales growth slowed sharply in July. 
That's as the country faces floods in several regions and new CCP virus outbreaks that have disrupted business operations. Industrial production in the world's second largest economy reported on Monday a 6.4 year-on-year growth in July. That's 1.4% below expectations. Retail sales grew just 8.5%, which is 3% lower than forecasted. Exports unexpectedly slowed in the month as well. Production control sent crude steel output to the lowest monthly level since April 2020. The country has also faced severe weather in several provinces, with record rainfall in Hernan province last month, causing floods that killed more than 300 people. Upon the news of China's performance, Asian share markets dipped on Monday. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And now let's look to Chinese companies trading in the American market. Stock prices for several of China's major companies recently took a plunge. The Chinese regime is continuing its suppression of private businesses, now targeting the online insurance industry. Japan SoftBank, a major investor in Chinese companies, including Alibaba, says it may pause its Chinese investments for a year or two while the suppression continues. I talked to Milton Esradi about it. He was the chief investment officer for Nomura Capital Management for 14 years and spent much of his professional life analyzing China. Asked if American investors will follow Nomura's lead or if the CCP risk has already been priced into the stocks. I think the bulk of it for now has been priced in, but everyone is rethinking um, across all my contacts, whether they're state-run funds or privately uh, run money or um, money managers, professional money managers, all are rethinking the China risk in their portfolio. So this is not quite done. I think the bulk of it for now is done, but people will continue to reassess. And of course, a lot depends on how China behaves going forward. A lot of people as well, they probably don't know it, but a lot of the, the pension funds, right, the American pension funds are also exposed to Chinese stocks. And we saw, I believe, a trillion dollars was, was wiped off the value of Chinese equities since this happened. But a lot of these uh, American pension funds, they, they tend to just track the MSCI indexes, the kind of standard indexes, am I right, which are very exposed to, to Chinese stocks anyway. Will, will they reassess their, their positions? Well, they could. I mean, if they're in an index, it might be more difficult. Of course, China is now a much smaller part of the index than it was six weeks ago because it's all a value-based situation. So their exposure to China has fallen with the devaluation of the Chinese stocks. But they're, they're, they're rethinking this. I have a contact in Orange County, which is a huge public pension fund, and they say they're, they're still rethinking their position on China. Now, they have both a, a, a link in the um, uh, MSCI. They also track an emerging markets index, which has China, and an Asian index, which has China. They may say, well, to the extent that China dominates these, we're going to pull back. That's an interesting point. So a lot of these indexes are, are, are price, you know, depending on, on the price of the, the, the shares. So a lot of these Chinese stocks have fallen out. It seems to be, because we've always heard that China really relies on foreign capital, U.S. dollars, through corporate bonds and, and different avenues. This is, does this hurt them? Is it big enough to hurt them? I think it, it could be. If people avoid China, the investments in China, then it will, it will hurt China. Um, and as I said in many of my things I've written, of course, I don't think that bothers the Chinese Communist Party as it would any other government because they value secrecy and control over growth. But this could harm Chinese growth. They have grown throughout this enormous, fantastic growth period on foreign capital. Interesting. And I really feel that a lot of these big companies, your Alibaba's and your Tencent's, they, they did, at least among a certain number of people, they, they, they helped the Chinese image and they helped the image of the Chinese Communist Party. They became very mainstream. Alibaba is, is a mainstream company. And when you think about the totalitarian nature of the CCP, you would think this is a great win for them. But how important was that innovation? And, and do you think this type of suppression will suppress this type of innovation going forward? 
Well, I think it will, especially since the, the party or Beijing, the government in Beijing, and they are one and the same, um, has made it very clear that they're willing to sacrifice these uh, these growth opportunities, what we would consider modern um, uh, growth opportunities, whether it's Alibaba or ride hailing or any of the other things that, uh, that they have stepped on effectively. Um, I think that there's going to be less of this kind of development that goes on. There will be less foreign capital put into it. And it, it, it defeats China in another way as well. Uh, as early as 2005, 2006, we had people in China saying, um, we have to um, uh, uh, shift away from manufacturing export-oriented economy toward a more consumer-based economy, that kind of balanced growth that China needed. And this, of course, is defeating that shift. And that's it for today's China in Focus. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.